Well, I'm sitting here with four people that I admire greatly. Dwayne Allen of the Oak Ridge Boys, Deborah Evans Price, Kelly, Neelan Clark, Jason Clark of the Neelans. Hey, Rick. <laughs> I have admired you guys a long time, and uh, so it's a pleasure to sit down with you. I want to show you something. We're going to talk about Country Faith, uh, the new CD in the series, Country Faith. But first, I want to show you something that's really cool. I brought it from home. I bought this from the Oak Ridge Boys record table in 1972. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my. Is this cool? Wow. Well. So, I don't know. That. Oh, oh, that so is so cool. signed this for me in 1972. Wow. Oh, look at you. <laughs> I've, I've held on to this all these years. How great Back is that? As a, so this is going to make us all feel old. You I know, love it. I can't help that. But oh, That was back before William Lee lost his razor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. He looks good. You, you know, uh, I don't want this to be sad, but I see three people in that yes, shot sir. that I would have to say rest in peace. Yes, sir. Noel mm -hmm. Fox, Don Breland, and Mark Ellerby. Mm -hmm. That's and, right. Uh, you know, that, that was the ultimate group uh, with band that I dreamed of. And I dreamed of getting a band so good that we wouldn't have to hire session musicians, that they would be good enough that they could also do session work. There are two different types of recordings uh, and performances. Some session musicians can be great in the studio, mm -hmm. but can't kick it off the front of the stage yeah, on right, stage. Right. Some musicians who play on the road many times are required to play more mm -hmm. because you have less instruments because you can't afford that many. Yeah. And so they play more. And when they get in the studio, they play too much. Mm -hmm. And it's not how much you play, it's how little you play in the yeah. studio. Yeah. And you just play the tasty things and you let the, the, uh, the foundation be set with the bass guitar and the drums and the piano mainly. And the, the rest of the instruments are mainly just color instruments. But if you've got someone on the piano that is accustomed to filling all the gaps, it doesn't leave anything for sure. anybody right. else. Exactly. So some people can play on the road uh, and play really well there and, 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 and be very uh, performance conscious and can sell it to the people. But they get in the studio and it's a different animal. And it works both ways. There are a few people that can do both, but they have to understand that they're different. Right. And if you can understand that, then you're on your way to being able to do both. That band stayed together for many years throughout the 70s, so all of you guys. Oh, and I I'm remember sure our remember. band yeah. talking about how they love yeah. that band. What an influence. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we worked all the way across uh, Canada into California rehearsing every day and then we got a room at Whitney studio on the side just a side room set up all of our equipment and re rehearsed for five days and then we went into Whitney studio and cut that album light wow and it was the ultimate album that we ever that I ever wanted to record as a gospel group it won like four dove awards and we only added a percussionist and a rhythm guitarist to the session. But we had that huge, it's got the biggest organ in any recording studio is in Whitney studio, now owned by MCA, I think. But uh, we had that organ on, uh, it won't be long till we'll be leaving here and you hear that, that big pipe organ come in at the end, those are real pipes, mm. uh, blowing the organ sound on that song and all at once you feel like you're caught up in the air. Well, that's because the organ with pipes is that air instrument. You know, wow. it gives you that feeling yeah. that you're just leaving this world. You know, it won't be long till we'll be leaving. That organ comes in on the last. Mm -hmm. That was my ultimate recording a project in gospel music. Wow. And those are the guys that were on it. Yeah. They're, That's neat. They're iconic. And speaking of iconic, Deborah, you'd never say this. You would never say this about yourself. But Deborah Evans Price is an iconic name. 
in the music industry. Yes, you're years, right. yes, <laughs> you're exactly sweet right. to say yes, that, Rick. Was. I don't think that at all, but that's very, but I very say kind that of because, you. Well, I can say that. I know you wouldn't say that, but I can say that because this was partially your vision. This mm -hmm. Country Faith series was your vision, your brainchild. Uh, tell me about how that idea came about and how it all got started. Yeah, I tell you, cut, doing the Country Faith books and, and the albums has been such a blessing because it kind of is, is everything that I love and been a part of for years coalesces with this this brand because I've always loved country music and been very plugged into that and covered country artists for years and, and gospel artists. So it kind of it brings together everything that I love. But um, it started when there was a guy named Bob DeMoss at Zondervan Publishing that was looking for a journalist to do a, a book talking to country artists about their favorite scriptures. And so I got a meeting with him and got the deal and then had three months to talk to over 50 people. <laughs> So I was like texting my buddies and, you know, and like, you know, chasing after people after concerts and stuff. And that first book we had everybody from the Oak Bridge Boys to Carrie Underwood, Miranda Lambert and Brad Paisley and Alabama. Crazy. and Yeah. And just Doyle Lawson. Got some bluegrass buddies in there. And mm. so it was just a wonderful thing to, to so work So it started on. as a book. And so what year mm -hmm. did that book come out? That was in the first book was 2013. And then a couple years later, we followed with Country Faith Christmas that has recipes and photos. You'll see Dwayne at Christmas when he's a little boy. <laughs> I love seeing all those old photos. Alan Jackson sitting on Santa's lap when he was a kid. So we had the, the Christmas book and the, the companion CD. And we're up to, this spring will be our ninth music collection. Okay, so you had a hymns, you had a Christmas. Mm -hmm. you, so now you have Country Faith Southern Gospel. Yes, oh, which I'm so excited. Which I love Southern Gospel. We get Gospel. to be on a project with Elk Ridge Boy. That's awesome. Well, Jason and Kelly, uh, Kelly in particular, we go way back. No, so I, not too far. I know. <laughs> out of all the people here, I don't want to make you feel old. We go way back. We do. Uh, we do. We do. I've been I doing had, this a long time. Had the privilege of knowing your dad, Rex mm -hmm. Neelan, and. Uh, Getting to know him over the years, I know that he loved to uh, discover new songs. He did. And discover mm -hmm. new songwriters. And was it Rex that found Oh for a Thousand It Tons? was. Um, it was. Um, tell me about that. He, um, I think it came from Ken Harding. Um, Ken Harding got it through David and Lisa Binion, and they sent a couple of songs, that one and um, We Shall Behold the King. And... Um, we recorded both of them at the same time and even titled the project, We Shall Behold the King. But it was Oh for a Thousand that really just took the country by storm. And it was shocking to me because it was a little more progressive uh, than Sun's Coming Up or Come Morning. Um, and, and I was really, it really uh, shocked me that Daddy would like a song that was a little more inspirational. I, I wouldn't say it was contemporary, it was more inspirational and something we'd never done. And he said, this is a hit song. And he said, Kelly, you better sing this song. Cause you know, he, he, he was a delegator. You gonna sing this one, you gonna sing this one. And I just said, okay, but I really loved it. I yeah. loved it, it was, it was so different to record that kind of song and then to stage it for the first time. And when we got to the, uh, we, we always talk about the intro and how the intro would change with the keys. And I loved that it was so standout. It, it was a standout intro. But I love the part in the middle where we'd been big in the chorus and it goes down to just us four singing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing in honor to the king. And, and, and it was just, and then we went, we flipped the parts up and it got big again. And that audience immediately, you know, just, it just wowed them, but not because of us, but because of the words and oh, for a thousand hands to raise it and honor to the, the holy, king. It, it ushers in a holy it, presence. It does. Yeah, it still. absolutely did. And it was something that um, I'd never experienced before. And it just, my whole spirit, everything was just overwhelmed. And it just took me right to the Lord. And for those that are not familiar with the song, uh, what does the song talk about? It's, it basically says, if I had a thousand hands, I would raise them all. Right, right. In honor to the king. Yeah. If I had a thousand tongues, I would use them all mm -hmm. to, to sing, sing praises. praises right. yeah. yeah. And that, that title can be uh, misunderstood if they don't understand what the song is right. about. But what, what year did you first start um, staging that song? Or oh, my goodness. I, I think it roughly? was 81, 81, maybe 82. So when you got the call that they wanted to add this to 
uh, Country Faith. How did that come about? Oh, well, I was thrilled, thrilled that we could put this song that we've sung for four, you know, 40 years or so and, and to be on a project with our friends and, and be a part with Deborah and, and the Oak Ridge Boys, because <laughs> I've loved them my whole life and known them my whole life. And, and Dwayne tried to take my daddy from me many times, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, uh, Daddy really had, I think he really um, thought about it a lot, you know, because he loved a male quartet, and he, Dwayne wanted him to sing with him, and, and they were such good buddies, but I think the daughter won. Uh, the daughter won. <laughs> she did. <laughs> well, were you uh, involved in choosing what songs would go on here? Mm -hmm. uh, That's the hardest part of all these country so faith projects. Sure. <laughs> all of them, and they're not all older songs. They're, they're timeless classics, mm -hmm. but then you've got Mark Lowry on here, you've yep. got Joseph Habedank on mm -hmm. here, and then some timeless classics. But what, what made you choose Oh for a Thousand Tongues for this? That was hard because when, I mean, obviously the first thing I'm thinking is I gotta have a Neil and song on yeah. here. Yeah. But then they've done so many incredible songs over they the have. years, it was really hard. But I wanted to reach back into something that for decades people have associated with the Neelands and that has meant so much to so many people. So and maybe it's still on the relevant next today. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It still has a tremendous impact. So then maybe we do, when we do a follow up project, then we'll pull a new song. You know, right. yeah. you, that was a perfect. Hard. It was a perfect song. It, even of our entire catalog, new and old, I would say that it's still our most requested. Oh. You know, in churches. I love to go through a church uh, choir books, you know, when we're traveling. And there's hardly ever a church that we go to that you won't find over a thousand somewhere in their performance mm -hmm. catalog, you know. Mm -hmm. So, great choice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, you know, to this day, you guys uh, still do patriotic songs. Mm -hmm. You do family songs. Have you brought back over a thousand times? Oh, yeah. We, just we, 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 did a, we did a new arrangement right before. One of my mentors was Larry Goss. And mm -hmm. about, I don't know, it was a month before he passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, I told, I, I, I was writing actually for a choir project with Larry and I said, I want to do a new arrangement. Stick with the same uh, piano artistry that he put on the original. He was the original arranger. But, and, but I want new orchestra, and, and so um, we did that and with the Nashville String Machine, and that was one of his last pieces that he ever worked on before he passed away. Wow. Yeah. Well, it features Kelly, the voice of Kelly, and nobody sings it like mm -hmm. the Neelands. Mm -hmm. Nobody can sing it like the Neelands. Oh, I agree. Thank you. Dwayne Allen. I've heard guys, <laughs> of the, <laughs> guys of the group in various different ways say, all they ever really wanted to do was sing in a gospel quartet and ride down the road in a quartet bus. Would that be a true statement? Sure. And after this, I, I would I would not limit it to gospel, but I would say that that was my first love. Yeah. <clears throat> and when I mention not limiting it to gospel, because I love the harmonies, mm. and I could hear the harmonies in gospel more so than anywhere else. But along about the same time that I was getting my chops together down in the cotton fields in Texas, I started collecting everything the Sons of the Pioneers ever recorded. Oh, wow. I've got everything, every movie they ever made, every TV show they ever made, every, every recording they ever made. And the same holds true with the Lubin brothers, the Everly brothers. Uh, uh, just about every uh, black gospel group that was on a national level, Harmonizing Four, Fairfield Four, the Golden Gate Quartet, Swan Silver Tones, uh, just about every black gospel group that you could get their albums, I had them. I still have them. In fact, Elvis's first, second gospel album, he wanted to do spirituals. Herman Harper called me. Our office was in the RCA building. He said, you want to meet Elvis? And I said, I'd love to meet Elvis. He said, well, get those Golden Gate records you got <laughs> and bring them down to RCA Studio oh A, goodness. where we cut our latest album. Yeah. And he said, Elvis wants to cut spirituals, and I know you've got all their albums, so we'd bring those and come on down. Mm -hmm. Well, I did. And he cut about six songs out of my catalog. They're not my songs. They were just albums that I collected. But I study groups 
from the Philadelphia doo-wop groups to the Detroit groups, the Temptations, every everybody that's ever been a group, I've studied their catalogs and see what made them a group. And in those catalogs, you'll find someone like Kelly or Jason who has an ear for what is a hit. Kelly got hers from her dad. And working with Jason recently, I still don't know where he got off of what he's got because <laughs> he just blows my mind with some of the things he comes up with. I'm still studying him because I haven't found all the places he can go yet. And and uh, I'm, I, I know right now what makes uh, the Neelands click. I know where their soul is. And you ha you can find a hit song, but you have to know how to interpret it and then share what you feel. Mm -hmm. If you keep it all within yourself, the audience will just sit there. Yeah. But if you let them have it instead of trying to make them take it, those are two different things. Mm -hmm. That's and good. That's good. I like That's to good. think of my soul as being something I want to share with the audience. And I use a rope as, uh, as kind of a crutch. And I tie a knot on the end of it, and I throw it down through here to my gut, to my diaphragm. And I bring it up here, and I bring it over the top of my mouth. And I hand them the other end of it, and there's a knot on it. Pull my, pull my heart out, and I let them take it. I don't force it on them. I let them have it. And if you do that, you will never have vocal problems because you're not supposed to force your singing. You're supposed to support your singing with your diaphragm, and you let that voice just flow out, and they'll bring it out for you if you will share it. Now, there's a secret to that. You must believe. If you believe in what you're doing, they can pull it out of you. Then they're sharing it. And how you know it's real is it will come back to you. Because we are like, God, get, God made us a light. We're a light. Yeah. But they're a reflector. Mm -hmm. Some people come off stage in some of these big festivals. I remember one we were working up in St. Clairsville, Ohio, and this guy came off, country music artist, I'll not call his name, and said, oh, man, there are a bunch of dead, you know what, out there. Uh, just do your show, get off, it's hot. <laughs> well, when we went on stage, Joe was first, and I saw him ran out, and he jumped the monitor on the floor <laughs> and slid into the microphone. Well, we all followed, you know, and, and like it was gangbusters the whole time because I don't think like that. Yeah, right. I think if you shine your light, yes, they have a reflector. That's and good. if you feel it back, you're giving it right. Yeah. If you don't that get is. it back, you ain't shining your light right, right. Yeah. because they paid to buy a ticket that's their sure. reflector. They want to be there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they paid to see yeah. your light. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a gift from God, and I don't want to ever abuse it. Yeah. Mm. That's good stuff. That's great. In spite of the so. incredible uh, career that you had in country music, uh, you guys never stopped singing gospel music, mm -hmm. no. songs of faith. Uh, we were talking a little bit before we started uh, recording this, and uh, on our last show, I, after the show, I counted the songs that we were doing, and there were five gospel songs on the show. And uh, we have never ceased to sing gospel music. We just got out of the gospel music business. And the country music business is where we make our living now but we sing country and we sing gospel music. Mm -hmm. And I never have quit loving gospel music. That was my first love, even before I went to college and got a degree in classical music, uh, studying with Metropolitan Opera stars. Uh, that's a long way. The Metropolitan <laughs> Opera is a long yes, way from is. the Grand Ole Opry. <laughs> <laughs> they even spell it differently, you know? They do spell it differently. But I'm somewhere in the middle of all of that. You know, I, I, I know it and I, I know how to do the opera and I know how to do the Opry mm -hmm. and it all comes from here. Yeah. And if you do it right, you can do either if you've had the training to do so. And I've been lucky that 
I was raised with a family that gave me all the support in the world and $100 for a four and a half year college uh, degree. Mm. That's all my family could afford. That was my mother's collection when her brother got killed in a train wreck. Mm. She collected $100, she gave that to me. Mm. My mom and daddy didn't have the money to send me to college. I worked my way through sometimes three, three jobs a week, three wow. part-time jobs. Well, we, we were on their tour. We opened for them in Canada this past summer, and that was so much fun. But I will say, uh, I had a, we wanted to see their, their show and performance, but I got a really good seat. And I'm a big fan. I'm recording and taking pictures. And it was so inspiring. Number one, their communication skills are unbelievable. Their energy was unbelievable. And when they did their gospel music, 2,500 country music fans, it was electric in the place. Mm -hmm. And we all left there, my family and I, we were talking about that for a week. And I think we shared that with you. It was, and they had just finished a 17 day tour. This was the last show on that 17 day <laughs> tour. They, they and it had was so much energy, I couldn't even believe it. I, I was embarrassed for myself because <laughs> they, they had so much, they brought it. Yeah. They should have been tired. Yeah, no, was, they should have been tired, they but they be. weren't. <laughs> they were all like, you were tired because you'd been through a dozen airports <laughs> yes. and almost never got out of Canada. Oh and almost scary. never got but out of Canada. But you know what? On our way back to the airport, Jeff Stice was with us, uh -huh. and we pulled up every song that you've ever done, yeah, every did. hit you had. Uh -huh. it. it was amazing. It was amazing <laughs> the things that you have done through your career and the hits. I mean, the heart hits, just hit after hit. After. I thought, just give us two. And we, <laughs> we got to, and we were flying behind you guys. You guys got home a lot quicker than we did. And so we were coming through. You remember this in that little bitty airport in Canada? And we were coming behind. We were right there. And one of the ticket counter people, they were still like uh, buzzing. He was telling everybody, and I just met the Oak Ridge Boys. I just got my picture made with the Oak Ridge Boys. You know, it was so cool. That was neat. And there's, oh. a, there's a song from you guys that is new, uh, or at least it's new to me on this Country Faith mm -hmm. CD, Brand New Star. Mm -hmm. Where did you, who wrote that song? Where did the Oak Ridge Boys Two young song? writers with David Cobb's company wrote the song, and they're 27 years old, and it's a, it provides us a different way to look about death. And we'd recorded the song, and we're working on it. We wanted to get it. We knew that it, it just had to be just right because it has a particular message in it. And Joe went to the writers and said, I believe this is the happiest song I've ever heard about death. Mm -hmm. And the writers looked at him very deadpan and said, well, that's the point. Mm -hmm. So the point is, if you know where a loved one is headed, the Bible gives us a blessed assurance that we will be together again. We will see each other again. We will know as we are known. And I believe that. I believe every word of the Bible. And I believe the part of the Bible says that except you have the faith as that of a little child, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. Well, I choose to have the faith of a little child all the time. Mm -hmm. I believe God made everything, these microphones, these mic stands, this carpet, this building, everything around us, all of us, everything we wear, so I don't have to go to a church to see God. I go to church. I'm a member of a big church here in town, and I go as often as I can. But if I go anywhere, I don't go looking for God. I take him with me. Yeah, that's right. And I feel like that God hears and knows everything I say, everything I think, everything I do. So I just make him. I don't make God complicated. I make him welcome. Yeah, He's true. right here. He's yeah. right here. And so this song is about telling people that if you believe in God, there is something better waiting for us. Mm -hmm. It's another life. It's a life of eternity. Can you just stop for a minute and and just focus on eternity? Eternity. That never ends. So what are you waiting for? Mm -hmm. You know, 
if you miss it, you don't have another chance. If you choose to accept it, you're making a really good choice. And the song talks about making the right choices and knowing someone did and that they're in heaven now smiling down on us. There's a brand new star up in heaven tonight shining down on me. Let it shine, let mm -hmm. it shine. Aww. That's good. <laughs> and I understand it's the final cut on Country Faith Southern Gospel. I understand it has a special meaning for you, Deborah, after it, the passing of your mom. It does. When my mom was battling lung cancer last spring, Dwayne emailed me that song. And I just cried and cried and cried. Mm -hmm. But it it got me through that time because of what the song says, there's a brand new star in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so thinking of my mom that way, in, instead of just wallowing in how much I missed her, just that song just meant so much to me. Yeah. And Dwayne's friendship and his prayers. And I remember after mom passed, he called to check on me. And, and that just, such a good man, such a good friend. Mm -hmm. But that, when we started talking about the songs we wanted on this album, oh my gosh, I just had to have that. But, and you got but, it. And we did, thanks to Dwayne and a, a guy at the record company named Logan. Logan because, Rogers, and yeah. Lightning Rod Records. Yeah. Thank you, Logan. Thank you very much, Logan, because it's on their, their latest album. I mean, this album just has been out less than a year. And when I brought it up at the record company, when in a meeting at Word Records, they said, oh, we love that song. The other people in the room, but they said, that's on their new album, Don't Never Let You Have It. And I said, well, it never hurts to ask. I'm going to text <laughs> Dwayne. And so thanks to Dwayne guys. and Logan. Mm -hmm. Here it is, and that just means the world to me that it's it's the last thing people hear on the record. Well, we're out of time. I'm out of time, but I have enjoyed it. I want to thank you oh, all. Thank you so much. Out. How can we be out of time? you got the whole magazine. Let's just, <laughs> let's just do a whole special. <laughs> right? The whole magazine. Brian Smith is the boss here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, thank you all so much. Oh, thanks, Rick. So good to see you. you.